please join me in giving a warm welcome, a warm inbound welcome to Kim Orleski. you guys. I had the fortunate uh, opportunity to say hi to a bunch of you in the back as you guys were coming in and I was overwhelmed with how many people said that this was the session that they were looking forward to most. Uh, closing one-to-one -one sales fast from your one-to-many marketing leads. We're running into that a lot with HubSpot. If you are a HubSpot user, if you're not, we are talking about business to business conversations. You can apply this to business to consumer. You can apply this to product base. I primarily work in that non-tangible space. How do we create value from nothing, especially when we live in a very commoditized world? And it doesn't matter what you think you sell, even flights to Mars are one day gonna be commoditized because you're gonna have your options between SpaceX or Virgin Intergalactic, and I'm sure there's gonna be a couple other people that are gonna be popping up pretty soon. So we need to create crazy amounts of value. I'm very fortunate this is my second inbound. Uh, I guess I did a really good job because they told me this time they're gonna be filming me right here in the back. Awesome. Oops and then we lost the clicker. <laughs> so when we're, thank you very much, there we go. So I'm gonna start off with a true story and I don't know if this resonates with any of your companies, any of your own personal businesses. There was a, two gentlemen come into my office. They say, Kim, we've seen your work. We've been watching you on LinkedIn. We've been checking out your videos. You are the person we need. We need help closing. We have left our corporate jobs to start an engineering firm, and we are so excited. We've generated these great leads. People know who we are. We've generated them from word of mouth. We even threw a few bucks into a great LinkedIn ad campaign. We've had these fantastic meetings, and we've been meeting with these companies over and over. We have defined the scope of work already and we don't know how to close them, right? Maybe a few of us resonate with that. They're like, we just need you to come in. Would you come in for one meeting and just close the meeting? Now, I don't know about you guys, right? I would love to be that commando kind of person that comes in, says the one line, gets the deal closed, and I'm, whoosh, I'm out, right? When do we actually start to close? Does anyone know? The very beginning, the very beginning. The moment we start to open that door, we extend our hand and we say, hi, how are you? That is our first opportunity to close. So how did I get started where I got started? I didn't just become the leading sales coach. I actually have had years of experience. When I graduated university, I had a degree in finance and I was gonna sit in front of spreadsheets all day long, deciding on which departments were gonna get funding and which ones weren't. And as I went ahead and started looking for jobs, I was brought upon by a recruiter who said, oh sweetie, you have way too much personality to sit in front of spreadsheets all day. You, my dear, you are a salesperson. And I looked at her, I'm like, oh my God, I have a university degree. I am not a salesperson. That was the worst insult I could think I could get from anybody. I was fortunate enough though, I had just read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I had anybody read that one. You know, he gets his experience from working for Xerox and she says, I can get you a job at Xerox, would you be interested? And I thought, well, I've been told that some of the best sales training in the world. Let's go ahead, let's try it. And it does have some of the best training in the world because what I very quickly learned with my analytical mind, my process-oriented uh, way of thinking, was that sales is a process. You start at step one, you move on to step two, you go on, and as long as you follow the process, you are always going to get the results. If you don't follow the process, you can't get the results. You can't do 20% of the work and expect 100% of the results. So I followed it to a T, did really, really well with them. I continued on. I worked for a company doing medical devices. And if you've ever worked with doctors and plastic surgeons and dermatologists, you become a little bit more of an order taker than an actual journey person. Uh, I worked for another small company called American Express. Maybe some of you have them in your wallet. Another commoditized type of product, high value services no actual ability to really differentiate themselves minus what they tell you. 
Uh, and I am from Canada, so we have Purolator up there, which is the number one, I hear, there's one other Canadian here. Oh, a couple Canadians, oh, my heart goes out to you. I'm trying really hard not to say process and instead say process, so if I slip up. <laughs> Uh, so Purolator, ma major competitor when it comes to FedEx, DHL, uh, UPS, all the way up there. So, but yet again, same type of idea. I did really well with all of those companies all the way through, and when you work in corporate sales, it's almost like bliss. I was working from home my 35 hours a week, making 150,000 a year, even putting my feet up on my desk. I call my boss, We're working so hard, working so hard. Yet. That wasn't tw quite what I wanted. Because as I kind of hit that moment, you know, 30, 31, I started to wonder if this is my life by coincidence or by design. And because I see a lot of women in here, we're being honest, and we've already had the Scott Harrison, my ma mascara was running down my cheeks this morning. My critical moment was that breakup that I had and I realized I needed something else. What was I really wanting to do in my life? And so I sold it all. I sold the house, I sold the car, I traded everything for a, I don't even know what the metric or the conversion is, it's a 50 liter backpack, right? So what is that, about 27 gallons type of thing. It fit from my, the back of my bum all the way up to the top of my head, and you can see the photo of it. And I traveled by myself, 17 countries on four different continents saying yes to everything. Trying to discover what it was that I really wanted to do for my life. Was I in sales because I was really good at sales or was I in sales because I was chasing the money, because I was going after the gloriousness that it was. And for six months I wrote about the entire experience just reflecting, going on myself. And as I traveled through Australia and Southeast Asia and came around through the Middle East, hitting on a little bit of Africa, I ended this proverbial journey, this mountain that I just climbed, by climbing a literal one, Kilimanjaro, the largest mountain in Africa. And Tanzania is like no other place that I had ever imagined. I actually thought it was very much this desert wasteland. We see the pictures with the kids with the flies on their face and everything. And I thought it was like this, you know, just dry desert place. And it's actually quite tropical when you get there. It's big palm trees and, you know, these gorgeous grasses and ferns and everything. And as I hired my guide, my team, my guide is the one in the red shirt there a head chef, a few quarters, to take me up this mountain. It was amazing to go from this gorgeous tropical area and every day we would climb a little bit further and a little bit further. And by day two, we started to see a lot less trees, a lot less of that lush foliage. By day three, all of that started to turn into low-lying grasses, bigger rocks. Day four, there was almost no greenery anymore. The ice crystals started to form on the ground. And day five was like no other. Because as we were climbing and walking every single day, my guide would run in front of me as I'm hiking. I'd been carrying this backpack for six months. And he would run in front of me and say, Kim, pole, pole, which is Swahili for slow down. <laughs> what are you talking, I got this, right? Like I've been carrying a backpack for like the last six months, I got this. He's like, no, 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 Kim, pole, pole. On that fifth day, we don't wake up shortly after sunrise with a nice breakfast. It's freezing cold and I'm sleeping with all of my winter gear, my electronics actually pushed right up against my chest to prevent it from freezing. And at midnight, I hear it on my tent. It's my wake up call. And I open the tent and I look out and it's dark, it's black and this headlamp from my guide is shining right in my face. And he says, Kim, it's time to go. And as I kind of peer out, I see two sets of lights. One of them, every star that you could ever imagine in the sky. The other one, these little bobbing lights from everyone else's guides wearing the headlamps 
directly in front of them. So now we're not even the first ones to leave, but we start going along. And as I climb out, you know, I'm trekking. You know, it's cold, there's snow on the ground. I'm wearing everything I possibly can to stay warm. And hour one goes by, and hour two goes by. Hour three, and my camelback line has completely froze and I have no more water for the rest of the trek. Hour four, and I'm getting exhausted. I can feel the weight of my body starting to get to me. Hour five, I can no longer feel my hands and my toes. I'm freezing, I'm exhausted. And as we get closer to hour six, I look up and there's a new light. It's the top of the mountain. And I get closer and I'm starting to realize the altitude sickness is hitting me so I'm not quite completely aware of what I'm seeing yet. And it's this giant sign that says Stella Point. And as I come up there, this gentleman comes and grabs me and hugs me and he says, congratulations. And I get spun around by a woman and she goes, congratulations, we did it, we did it. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like, you know, and I realize what we did and my guy comes out to me and he says, we must keep going. Because we're only at Stella Point, we're not at the peak of the mountain. The peak of the mountain is Yuru, which is Swahili for freedom. And if you want to get to freedom, you have to dig deep and keep going beyond what you could imagine. And for another 45 minutes, I'm moving at this more zombie-like shuffle. I'm looking over to my right where you see these nice little clouds, the bottom right of the screen. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty. The sun is starting to rise, a nice cloud coverage. But we're on top of a mountain. We're well above the rise and fall of the clouds. That's a snowstorm. And my guy continued to push me along without telling me anything that was going on. I just had to keep following him, keep following him. It was because of him that we made it to the top of that mountain. That was the last clear picture anyone got that day. Everyone else had to turn around. And I'm eternally grateful for when things get really tough that I knew exactly where I needed to go and where I needed to follow. So that became the first of my entrepreneurial journey because I wrote about it, Success Magazine found me, called me the most inspirational blogger that year. HubSpot, HubSpot invited me to come speak at Inbound last year, so this is now my second HubSpot. I've been called the sales leader to follow by LeadFuse. I don't have Panadox on there, sales pop. And that's me actually accepting the award for female entrepreneur of the, world, uh, the year. I wish the world, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Just call that one out. Um, female entrepreneur of the year by Startup Canada. Uh, you might also know this guy, Grant Cardone, if you follow sales. He's also said that she is somebody that you absolutely need to follow. So let's get to what was going on with that guy, with those two gentlemen that walked into my office telling me, Kim, we need someone to close. The first thing is, and maybe you're suffering from one of these, is that I need lots of leads. Do we have any marketing companies, marketing agencies in here, right? You've heard this from your clients who have said, we need more leads, we need more leads. And then when you go ahead and you create these, these fantastic websites and ad campaigns and you're bringing them more leads than ever and they say, you know what, we don't get it, we haven't received our return on investment yet. We have all these new leads but nothing's closing. You don't actually need more leads, you need more quality leads. And chances are you probably already have those quality leads, you just haven't done anything to nurture them and to have those conversations with them. These gentlemen were going ahead and spending more time blogging and sending out ads and doing all this other things, thinking, well, if I have more, if I have more, if I have more, and I'm like, what are you doing with the ones you already have? Go spend time with them. Because marketing brings people to the door and sales invites them in. We want people to come to our door, yes, but if there's no one there that's actually going to open that door and say, come on in, have a good time, let me show you around, all of that is meaningless. And if we're gonna allow everybody to walk through our house, we're all of a sudden gonna turn ourselves into some type of college kegger party. Nobody respects that, right? The whole place gets trashed. I had another person tell me this in a different way. They said, you know what, Kim? Marketing's like flirting and sales is dating. And I get that. Because you would never somebody have somebody come up to you and be like, how you doing? 
and then immediately go, we wanna get married. <laughs> Where's the dating process? We need to have that interaction. We need to go ahead and spend a little bit more time with them. So the quickest way of doing this is actually as quickly as possible, especially those that are in those high value services, is to get those conversations from online to offline as quickly as possible. I see so many people that have gone ahead and they have automated their marketing campaigns to the T. They're like, oh, we have the best solution ever, Kim. We have somebody comes into our website, we send them a whole bunch of emails, we send them a whole bunch of information into a webinar, and da 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 they're engaged the entire time. I'm like, great. How soon does somebody get on the phone and call them? Well, I, we don't call them, they call us when they're ready. Right. Well, who's gonna initiate that conversation? If, you, if part of your automated marketing campaigns is not to go get somebody to get a, give you a phone number, at what point are you going to start that conversation with them? We want to be able to talk to them, and the sooner you start that conversation, the better. Don't take a high-touch sales process, a high-touch relationship, and try to move it into a low-touch medium. Nobody's ever going to buy a Bentley based on a bunch of emails that they've received. They want to actually experience it. They want to check it out. They want to go for the test drive. They want somebody to talk to them all about that. And when we get that phone number, what's the number one goal of that phone call? To get the meeting, thank you, it's right there. <laughs> I've given you the answer. It's to get the meeting. And I see a lot of people that will tell me that the number one goal is to find out more about the company, to tell them all about myself. Nobody cares, they, do, they honestly don't. You have to go ahead and get the meeting. Your goal is to get the phone call. Your goal is to get that first date. And if you wait too long when you have that phone number to get that first date, your client's gonna respond back with like, new phone, who dis? <laughs> Fatal number number two, all meetings are good meetings. We've seen that little comic, right? Are you bored? Do you wanna have new friends? Do you wanna show people how smart you are? Hold a meeting. <laughs> we don't wanna just have meetings for the sake of meetings. We want to actually ask ourselves, what is the intention of this meeting? Where are we in the sales process to actually move this forward? How will we know it's a good meeting? Spend five or 10 minutes before you even go into the client's office or get on the phone or Zoom or Skype or whatever medium you're using to be able to connect with your client on that face-to-face, voice-to-voice interaction. And ask yourself, what do we ideally want to get as the goal for this? If you don't set the goal, it will never happen. Sometimes the goal might be just to determine, are they even a perfect fit for us to continue this conversation? Sometimes the goal is going to be, we need to better understand what their problems are, or maybe we're actually at that lucky point where we're now presenting the solution. We're presenting them the offer, this is a proposal. And when we get to proposal stage, we don't spring this upon our clients. I'll get to that in a second here. But the client is fully aware that they're at proposal stage. Because when we set up the proposal, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, I'm going to be giving you everything you need to make a decision. That is the intention, that is the wording we use, because we're not just presenting to them and hoping they say yes. We are presenting everything they need to make that decision. And we have to know where we are and where our buyer is in their journey. Because we'll spend a lot of time talking about where we are in the sales cycle, but we don't think about where the buyer is in their cycle. Where are they in that process? Lead qualification. We qualify our clients, our prospects early on, but we qualify them again and again and again. We want to know exactly where they are at any given time, because I don't know about you, but things can change very quickly. And we'll have clients that will have budgets, will change, expand, shrink. We'll have decision makers that will change and expand. Timelines will change and expand and shrink. We don't know where they are, so we start off every meeting summarizing, Mrs. Customer, the last time we met, you said that you had $250,000 to spend, that Jacob was gonna be a part of this conversation and that you wanted to see a solution by September 30th. Is that still the case? Yes, it is. 
Fantastic, okay, we can move forward. What has changed, right? We wanna know that. We don't, I use Banting here, this is actually stolen from IBM of all places. They use this as their lead qualification side of it, and I'm not gonna get into the arguments on whether Bant is still relevant or not relevant. I love it. I love it because it really summarizes the things that you need to know in order to determine whether you are actually qualified or not qualified. This is not the order that we ask the questions. We don't just go ahead and ask somebody, do you have budget, right? Well, how much are you willing to spend on this solution? Okay, <clears throat> terrible questions, terrible. Let's stop asking those, right? We find out whether a client is lead qualified or not by actually asking them other questions. What would it mean to you, Mr. Customer, when you're able to now do this faster, better, cheaper, more efficiently? How much more value will that bring to your organization? How much more revenue will you be able to contribute to the bottom line? Great way of finding out budget. Who else is involved with our decision-making process? Who else should we involve? Right? We also want to know that. Right? And timeline. Timeline is not when do you want to have a decision made by. Okay, another terrible question, because we don't understand what the process is. Process. The process is in order to be able to have that conversation. Right? I want a date, and I don't want just any date. I want to know why that date is really important. Well, I wanna, I wanna have something decided by December 30th, fantastic. Why then? Why is that really important? And when we are talking about budget, even when the client tells you that they only have this much to spend, it never actually means that that is all they have to spend. Has anyone ever spent something over their budget? <laughs> like every arm should go up here, unless you were like one of those people who's like, I watch every penny every single time, Kim. I know exactly where I am, right? We justify to ourselves why something is worth an additional investment. We justify, we talk to our, wow, I, I am gonna save extra money here, and you know, and this is gonna allow me to do so much more, and now, and now our business is gonna grow and expand, and we're gonna have even more clients and more revenue, so I can probably spend even more on that solution. Know where your buyer is. Be with your prospect, not ahead of them. Ask yourself critically, where are they in their decision making? Because at the end of the day, sales is being a tour guide. We walk into a museum, we shine the flashlight around, and we say, you know what? This is one thing that you need to see, and here's one other thing you need to see, but please explore the space. And the person goes around. Whereas if you think that you're not doing that, if you're trying to lead your client, all you're actually doing is pulling that cat on a leash. And if you've ever seen somebody pull a cat on a leash, the cat just leans over and dies. It's like, I don't want to be a part of this. <laughs> don't try to be pulling your cat on the leash. So this is your buyer's journey. This is essentially what they're going to be looking at. By the time we engage them, at that sales side of it, they're usually around that seek portion. They will find us through that one-to-many marketing leads because they have awareness of a problem. They have a symptom. We have WebMD'd ourselves, right? Our clients and our business-to-business -business clients have done the exact same thing. These are some of the problems I have. Here's what my solution is. Okay, you know, now just go tell me what the price is. Go tell me what that is, right? Does that necessarily mean that that's how we should diagnose them? If you went to a doctor with a WebMD printout and say, doctor, based on all of this, it says that I have tuberculosis. What kind of doctor would be like, oh yeah, definitely, here you go. They would still ask you lots of questions and they would still understand. Know where your buyer is through the process. You're going to be either in seek or in that collaboration phase, they're gonna be involving other people and your job is to as quickly differentiate yourself as possible. And differentiation does not come by talking about how great your product or service is. Differentiation comes with how well you connect with them. How well you get to know your client above anyone else. And when we align the buyer's journey to the sales cycle, now you actually know where you are. Because just because you ask the lead qualification questions does not mean that you're automatically over to proposal stage. The buyer might still be engaging with other suppliers. So if we know that, we need to help move ourselves along. 
Know where your buyer is. If they tell you that there's still other people that they're looking at, don't show them a proposal that's not going to solidify their decision. Find out what they need to know before they decided on you and then get to the proposal stage. And there's no such thing as a born salesperson. So I have an 18 month old son and at the 20 week, I see a couple of pregnant women here, so you, you know exactly what this is going on. Uh, at the 20 week uh, window, you can go in for the ultrasound. And this is the moment when you get to find out if it's a little boy or a little girl. And my husband and I are sitting there, he's in the back by the way, and my husband and I are sitting there holding hands and we're so excited. And at no point did we expect the ultrasound technician to screen my belly and say, oh, Kim, Sean, you're not having a little baby boy or a little baby girl. You're having a salesperson. <laughs> it's not something you were born with. It is something that we learn. It's something that we were taught. Fatal error number three, talking more than listening. If you think that sales is the process of what do I say, what do I say, what do I say, you have not done your job. Because who knows your client best? Your client. I would love to get more of that resounding excitement, you guys. Like, you know the answers. <laughs> right? We want to ask questions because questions show that we're understanding, that we're getting to know who they are. Dale Carnegie talked about this in How to Win Friends and Influence People. He says, if you want people to be genuinely interested in you, show genuine interest in them. If you want your client to be genuinely interested in your product and service and solution, be genuinely interested in where their business is going, what goals they are seeking, where their vision is, and what that strategy is to get there. Your product or service aside, it should be a portion of what the greater picture is. It shouldn't be the whole solution because nobody wants to be sold to. We have two ears and one mouth, okay? Let's spend twice as much time listening as we do talking. If you look at the end of your meeting and you realize that you have spent more than 30 minutes talking about yourself, you have spent way too much time. And especially in those very first meetings, it should be closer to 75% listening. The last 15 minutes is reserved for you to talk about yourself. And powerful questions will lead to those powerful answers. Especially at the very beginning, we want to move towards those open-ended questions. If you've ever taken a journalistic class or even eighth grade English, they teach you about the five W's, the who, what, where, when, how. And then there's, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I obviously didn't take that. <laughs> we want to move away from the closed-ended questions. Closed-ended questions give us very definitive yes and no answers. And they are used strategically in the sales conversation, but not at the very beginning, because it's a lot different when you ask somebody, do you have budget? Then if you ask somebody, how would you like to see this investment play out for you, Mr. or Mrs. Customer? Right? It's a lot different when we ask who else is going to be involved in this decision, this decision as opposed to asking them, are you the decision maker? Because if you ask somebody, are you the decision maker, their first answer is like, yeah, that's me. Even if they're not. Buyers can be liars. And if we ask them the right questions, we will get to the right answers. And we want to pull that discovery string. And that discovery string is really around that whole idea that whatever answer they give you, there's another answer behind that. Why is that important to you? This is one of my favorite questions. Why is that important? How often do we ask our clients, why is that important? They come to us for a reason. They say, yeah, we want this cheaper, better, faster, more efficiently. Great. And we continue on. Why is that important that you get it there cheaper, better, faster, more efficiently? Right. What would that mean when you're able to accomplish that? And how did that make you feel? A lot of speakers this weekend have, or this week have actually talked a lot about empathy, and I'm going to touch on that real briefly. But if we understand how this will make someone feel, now we're connecting with them on a greater basis. Because most decision makers, are somehow very involved in their company. They are the founders. They have seen those little infants grow into teenagers and these giant adults. We want to see them grow this. Because the person that asks the question owns the conversation. Right? 
Have you ever seen a cop drama where the, you have the guy being interrogated in the room and all of a sudden the guy who's being interrogated says, well, what do you think and everything? He changes the questions. The cop comes in, slams his hands down, and goes, I will be the one to ask the questions here. He does that because he has to own the conversation. If you are asking the questions, you get to steer where the conversation goes to. You get to just steer what is most important to that conversation, not the other way around. The other fatal error is that value is automatically earned. Just because you have a card that says Microsoft or IBM or Google Partner does not mean that you automatically have value in there. Value is earned. Earlier this year, I was shopping for a brand new website and I had three different companies come up to me wanting to pitch me their brand new website. And the first company says, you know what, Kim, we're gonna show you a proposal, a 20 minute meeting, we sit down and they say, okay, we're gonna send you the proposal. And it's this astronomical number. And I said, why is it so high? They're like, we're the best. We charge the more, so we're the best. I had no idea. Right? The second company asks me, what is my budget and can I fill out this form? I tell her my budget, I fill out the form, she gives me a price, eh, slightly higher than the budget, but she's met all my needs. Okay, fair enough. The third company goes ahead and has a meeting with me, and another meeting. And why is that important, Kim? And what would that allow you to do? What would this website be able to allow you to have a conversation with, with your new clients and prospects all the way through? And after four meetings, he came back with a budget that was four times more than what I had originally told the first person. I went with them. They understood where I wanted to go. And when I asked the, other, the second woman who says, well, I don't understand. She's like, if you would have told me your budget was that much, she's like, I would have given you a quote for that amount. <laughs> That's not my job. My job is just to understand what my problem is and have you help me solve that. So one of the questions I ask when we do sales training is often, will your client be willing to pay for the experience that you create in that sales meeting? I teach a lot of different types of companies. We did this with a print shop. They said, absolutely not. We would we would, our clients would never pay. I worked with an IT firm. They said, no, IT, in IT we do assessments with companies all the time. They would never pay for this. And I said, it's not about them actually paying for it, but are they finding enough value from it? Is it worth their time? And when I ask this question, even from the very first meeting, if I'm asking somebody for an hour of their time, I better be giving them more than an hour. I better be giving them insights into their company, challenging their status quo, making them think bigger, larger. That's worth something. And we never want to assume those two gentlemen came in and I asked them, who was the decision maker? Well, I think it's this person. And I said, do you think or do you know? No, 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 I'm pretty sure it's her. If we assume assumptions are the killers to any sales cycle, if you assume you are in deadly ground, you need to know, and if you don't know, ask the question. And then ask the question again, and ask the question with again. Because if we don't think, we have the answer, right? We're going to be thinking what the solution is. We need to know what the problem is and so that we can know what their solution is. And feel free to ask, who else are they looking at? Right? Don't be afraid to ask this question. And I love saying this one because people come, oh Kim, we could never ask who else they're looking at. That would bring up a whole idea. Like, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, how did they find you again? They Google searched. I'm like, and there wasn't like six other companies that showed up at the exact same time? If you ask them who else are you looking at, they're not gonna say, oh, you know what, you're right. You are probably not the only website designer in the Boston area. Right? We wanna know. Right? Then we can go ahead and talk about what differentiates ourselves, or at least we're armed with the information. As you get closer to the sales cycle, the clients are gonna start to ask you more questions. They're gonna provide you with objections. What would this mean, what would this mean? Listen, can you do it for 10% cheaper? That's sometimes where the objections will start to come up. And if we're actually just answering this, we are leaving money on the table. We don't just answer the objection. Because when we get to that objection portion, the client is now in that fearful idea. She's gonna ask me to buy at this point. Right, I need to find a reason why to say no. So we wanna understand what is going on for them. What is the actual problem 
that they're facing. Because most of the time it's not price, it's cash flow. Right? They can't, it's not that they can't afford us, it's that they can't afford the entire solution right now. How do we help them work through that cash flow? Right? It might be for delivery, it might be, you know, how do we, can, if you're gonna be bringing me a product or service, how do we then go ahead and market it? We can help you with that. We're, we're here, we're here with you. Contracts as proposals. I see this one all the time. When I ask people if they have gone ahead and proposed and they send me an eight page contract agreement saying this is their proposal. Uh, proposals are summaries of stories. They are the summarization of the entire journey you have been on with your client. And it didn't matter whether I was selling a $4,000 printer or a $40 million global payment solution, my proposal was a total of six slides every single time. It was the goals of the client, product and service aside, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, where do you want to see yourself in a year, three years, five years? We, we want to be the market leader. Fantastic. Right? I want to know where their current state is and then where do they ideally want to be? Now that we know what that looks like and where you want to be in a shorter period of time, where are you currently? What is the size of that chasm? Where they are and where they want to be. And we want to understand what their timeline is and what that investment is going to look at. Your proposal is a story. Tell it as such. Personalize it for your client. Don't just slap a bunch of options like an a la carte menu. That's not personalized. Because when we look at the proposal, we have to make sure that we are talking about the difference between the destination and the transportation. And a lot of people will focus so much on all the steps that we're going to engage our clients on all the way through. When Delta goes ahead and sells you a flight to Cancun, they talk to you about how wonderful Cancun is. And they talk to you about how terrible Boston is in the middle of February when it's cold and it's freezing. Right? This is where you currently are because Boston in September is beautiful. Why would you want to be in Cancun? Boston in February? Get me out. So we want to focus entirely on where your client is right now and where you want to be. What does Delta actually sell? Dreams, transportation, some of us out here experience. You go up to the ticket counter and you're like, I'd like to buy one dream, please. No, you buy a seat on a plane. Does Delta ever show you a commercial that talks to you about how wonderful their, their seats are, how they're gonna fly for approximately 30,000 feet in the air for four and a half hours. They have these wonderful trays that move up and down and lighting that lines the aisles. They never talk about that. That's not what you're buying. That's literally what you're buying, but that's not actually what you're buying. Your clients aren't buying what it's like to work with you. They're buying, the client is buying what it's like to actually have their solution in place six months after you have left. I was working with a custom home builder and they said, you know, we have the best custom homes. We go ahead, we source the land, we develop the entire design, the scope, everything else like this, right? Our clients love us. And I said, that's not what your client is buying. Your client is buying what it's like to have those keys in their hand and open that door six months after they've moved in. That's what they're actually buying. That's what you should be selling. And when we get to the proposal stage, this isn't that moment where we're so excited to get the contract and we're waving it out the car window as the client, last thing they see is our lights from our car driving out of their parking lot. This is a proposal. It's the first day of the rest of our lives. Don't email your proposals. Don't just send them to them. Best believe if my husband would have sent me an email saying, hey baby, want to get hitched? <laughs> a bunch of other women BCC'd in the tagline as well. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have said yes. And your clients are no different because this is the moment the contract in that proposal stage, that is the wedding. You still have the whole marriage. So let's show them that you're so as, you're as interested in the engagement and the wedding as you are in the marriage. And this is your last fatal error. 
logically, it makes sense. But Kim, logically it makes sense, the ROI. I have done business to business, high value corporate sales for 12 years. And if I just showed somebody the logical reasons of why a proposal makes sense, I probably would have done even better than I did. Because behind every business that is as logical and rational as we like to believe, there's that one person that is completely illogical and irrational making the decision. Right? They're gonna go with their cousin because, you know, cousin Greg, right, he has another company that does the exact same thing, right? You know, I, I wanna make sure that we're all playing nice when we are at Christmas dinner again. Right? And people are personally motivated. They want to know the reasons why we wanna do this. Because 95% of purchase decisions will actually take place in the subconscious. Malcolm Gladwell wrote all about this in the book Blink. Right? I think he had 12 chapters. I read the first four and I'm like, welcome, I got the point. Harvard Business Review did this exact same thing where they asked two, people, two different groups of people to try juices. And overwhelmingly, the first group said, we love juice A. And by the time they asked people why they liked it, they overwhelmingly chose something different. The moment we inject logic into the conversation, we can actually completely change the game. It's fair to ask your clients, what does your gut tell you would be the best solution for you? Right. Instinctually, what client or what supplier would you want to go with? Because the heart knows what the head actually needs. We are actually talking with people. We don't have to have everything make complete sense. We just have to make sure that the other person that we're talking with knows that we're with them for the journey. Their journey today, the journey in the future. We are connected with people. And those people that have a higher IQ, or EQ, the emotional quotient, actually score higher in terms of results and revenue. CEOs that have higher EQ actually report better revenues and profitability than CEOs that just score high on IQ. And companies are now getting to a point where they are actually measuring somebody's emotional quotient before deciding whether they want to hire them. Because that conversation, when we're present and we're listening and we're hearing the things that aren't actually being said, can help us so much more when we're closing those bigger deals. Because people will buy on emotion and then justify with logic. Right? But honey, I know the car is $20,000 more, but look at it. It makes me look so nice. <laughs> we will justify those really big purchases. The last thing as I was walking from Kilimanjaro, my guide had told me, he says, Kim, if you wanna go fast, you can go alone. But if you wanna go far, we have to go together. You have met a ton of people, you have implemented a ton of information. Who else are you going to involve in helping you go further in your company, in your business, in where are your goals that you want to achieve? The conclusion of this story, these gentlemen decided not to hire me. They decided that they would be fine on their own. They were close enough to closing the deal. It's 100 days later, it's actually closer to 110. I had to submit the slide deck early. Uh, 100 days later, they're still trying to get this client to buy. They had three months working with them, about still another three months afterwards. They still had more meetings with the clients. The decision maker has now changed, right? As same with the scope of work that they're working on. And they always still believe that the next meeting is the one to close. I know you guys are gonna get a lot of opportunities, right? I'm gonna be in the back after this. You can either text me directly that is my cell phone number, right? Don't call it right now, I don't want it to go off the hook. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm happy to take a business card and I am happy to involve you guys in more conversations so that we can help you sell more faster. My last question for you, 
as we do with every one of our sales training classes, is ask you, what is one thing that you will take away from today? Whatever that one thing is, whether you took notes or didn't, write down that one thing, what that one thing is that you are going to implement differently into your business and take action on that. Thank you so much. Thank you.